I want to ask that you don't just sit there. In Numbers chapter 32 and verse 6, we read the following words. Do you intend to stay here while your brothers go across and do all the fighting? Moses asked the men of Gad and Reuben. Do you intend to just sit there while your brothers go across and do all the fighting? We had a, a wonderful day on September the 22nd in our congregation. We were celebrating the fact that the church had met in this town for 44 years and the building we've been using has been used for 40 years. It gave us an excuse for a celebration, an opportunity to praise God and glorify him for all the things that he's done through different people over those years. We have some new deacons that we welcomed into their situation. We have youth work that is picking up. It's took us a while after COVID, but it's, it's going well and our outreach is doing good. But what if we were to just sit there? What if the people of the past had just sat there? What would have happened? What would there be to celebrate? As usual, the Bible has within it lessons for us today, even though things took place a long way in the past. Whatever our situation, wherever we are, I think we can learn a lot from what's written in Numbers chapter 32. Just a little bit about the situation. Prior to Israel occupying the promised land that God was giving to them, the tribes of Reuben and Gad wanted to Gad, sorry, wanted to settle in the land east of the Jordan. Their request and the response that Moses gave are given in that particular chapter in Numbers 32. 27 verses there, written so long ago and applying to a situation where a particular group of people were going into a land where they were going to live in a geographical location. And yet I believe there's a lot of practical advice for us today as the Lord's Church or as individual believers. Well, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start, as someone once sang. Let's review what was happening then. In Numbers chapter 32, the tribes of Reuben and Gad had expressed their desire to stay where they were on that particular side of the Jordan before entering the land. They had a lot of livestock and they saw that the land of Jazar and Gilead on the side of the Jordan where they were was good for their livestock. It seemed to make sense to want to stay there. So they asked to be given the land. They wanted possession of that particular bit. If they could settle there, well then they wouldn't need to go over into the Jordan with the rest of Israel and have to manoeuvre all their cattle into that particular journey. So they asked Moses, quite reasonably, I think, if they could stay put and they enjoy the land. And this is what prompted Moses to say what he did. Do you intend to stay here while your brothers go across and do all the fighting? Are they going to sit in comfort whilst their brothers are in discomfort? In fact, whilst they fight? Think about it. If it wasn't for their brothers, they wouldn't even have the land available to them that they wanted to stay in now. They just wouldn't have got there. What are they going to do in response to all that's happened up to that point that they can get this particular piece of land? Moses pointed out to do so would be very discouraging. Don't they remember how the ten spies discouraged the nation over and above the two spies who tried to encourage them to take the land. That discouragement delayed the nation moving into the land for 40 years. And now after all this time, they can enter into it. Interestingly, they, they wandered the wilderness for as long as our building has been opened. So 40 years does seem like a very long time. But who are our Joshua and Caleb's today? the two spies that said, we can do this, right at the beginning, 40 years ago. Who is it that brought you to the Lord? Who was your Joshua or Caleb who fought to win you for Christ, to bring you into spiritual life, out of spiritual darkness? What would it be like if you just gave up now and sat and did nothing to their memory and for all the effort that they made to reach out to you with the gospel? 
you reap the reward of their hard work, the forgiveness of sins, the freedom from guilt. But are you not going to share that with other people now? What if we didn't spend time in prayer and Bible reading? That we didn't show up at events where people could be encouraged as we talked about our faith and shared the, the trials and tribulations that we've overcome and how other people can do it as well. If those two tribes stay where they are and don't move forward with their brethren, they'd be no different than the ten spies that discouraged the folks all those years ago, who discouraged people with their report that we can't do this, it's too big a task. God's anger was provoked against them. Moses said, there would be a brood of sinful men and will increase God's anger against Israel if they were to stay put now and sit and not help. They would in fact destroy God's people. So what they're asking cannot and really should not be done. So an agreement is reached. Yes, you can have this land, but you can only really settle after you've helped your brethren settle. So Reuben and Gad offer to send their soldiers to help possess the promised land. Moses agrees, but he gives them a, a very stern warning. Listen carefully to this. The land they have requested will be theirs, but only if they see their offer through. They cannot break their agreement. They must do what they say they are going to do. If they don't keep that agreement, they will have sinned against the Lord. And they can be sure, we are told, their sin will find them out. Ever heard that phrase? This is where it's from. Moses making sure that they know they've got to do what they've promised to do. Their brothers deserve it. And God certainly deserves the people to do what they say they're going to do. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11 says this, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. What lessons can we take from those things that have been written down here? The things that have been recorded about them aren't written just as a, a quaint story, but they're a warning to us. So let's go give some consideration, give ourselves something to think about, as it were, about the warnings here and how they might apply to us in our lives today, even though we're not going into battle to fight over a bit of land. There is a, a warning, of course. We must understand that, like Israel of that day, we do have a battle to fight. And we're engaged in a spiritual battle, the consequences of which are far-reaching. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, Paul writes, All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that travelled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. God wasn't pleased with them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. This war that we're involved in, this fighting, is against Satan, and the spiritual forces of wickedness, and they're all around us. That's why God has given us spiritual armour to withstand them. The Lord's army, as we might want to call it, the church, fights this battle as each one of us serves in, in different areas. It could be in sharing our faith. It could be in building others up. It could be being a prayer warrior, as we might call it, for other people. It's with benevolence and helping people who need physical help that then might lead us to be able to share our faith with them. Let's consider again what's been done for us up to this present moment in time. Someone somewhere became a Christian, dedicated their life to Christ, and they might have been a family member, a friend of yours, someone who visited the area to come and put out leaflets or knock doors, and they contacted you. And amidst all the fears that go along with doing those kind of things and what kind of response am I going to get, 
you accepted the gospel. Many have come along from time to time in different places, making a stand for the truth and being ridiculed for it. But the Bible is God's word and we have to hold on to its truth. Others have stood firm against innovations which would lead to falling away from the truth as they decide to spruce up the worship service and things like that. But it's not what God has asked for. Some have come out of the world of sin and have struggled to do so, to beat their addictions. Some have come out of denominationalism, areas of false teaching, losing social standing and friendships because of doing it, but knowing that they need to follow the truth of God's word. Having done all that, it made it possible for people today, like you and me, to know the truth of God and the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's not take our salvation and what it costs people lightly. We're able to worship God in spirit and in truth that's acceptable to him, rather than entertaining to us. We're able to enjoy the blessings of being God's family. But the war rages on. Every thought of ours must be brought captive to Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. We're in a spiritual battle daily, even for our minds. We must continue to stand strong against the deceit of the devil that's spoken about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. This is a difficult battle, and we must fight it. So let's ask ourselves, will I just sit there while my brothers and sisters in Christ go to war? Dare I ask, are you going to sit there while your brothers and sisters go to war? How is it demonstrated? How do we just sit there while others go to war? What's that scene like? It's not just physically sitting in a chair, although, of course, that could be part of it. But it's by letting others do the work of the Lord's army. Not sharing our faith isn't going to get the job done. Are we going to just sit and enjoy the benefit of the efforts of others? Those who have worked so hard in the past to ensure that the light of the gospel still shines today. Those who have given beyond what they really could and should in order to support someone or some effort so that people can be saved. Like I said, we don't do it so much nowadays, but knocking on doors with all the fear that goes along with it. Speaking up for the truth of God's word when everybody else disagrees with you because it looks like science has got a better answer. What about the efforts of those who work so diligently now? Not just those in the past, but those who are doing things now. Are you part of that group that's actively doing something to make sure the message of the good news of Jesus Christ gets out into people's hearing and in their sight by the way we live? If you're part of a congregation, are you actively involved in the physical upkeep of the building so that that is maintained as a place where people can come and be encouraged in their faith and learn and then go out with the gospel? Or is somebody else doing all the maintenance and cleaning and tidying up and setting up and whatever? What part can we play physically and spiritually to ensure that the gospel goes out? Do we join Bible studies? Do we join in efforts that are made on special occasions? We can't always all be present at everything that's going on. But are we involved in something? Are we active in some way? If everybody does a little, then that's called leverage and a lot more gets done. The effect of sitting is the same as it would have been if the two tribes had gone to war. You know, some people have a little alarm on their watch to tell them that they've been sitting for too long, they need to stand up and move around a bit. Spiritually, we need a little alarm that goes off and says, you haven't done much lately. You need to tell someone. You need to encourage someone. You need to make a phone call or write a note or whatever it might be. How awful it must be to carry the burden of the work alone. And we don't need to do that in our day and age. Some people are isolated, of course. 
but in this digital age we can keep in touch and continue to encourage and reach out to others. A lack of involvement is just as detrimental as active opposition and just sitting there isn't good for our physical or spiritual health. The Bible has nothing good to say about the slothful. Proverbs 18 and verse 9, a lazy person is as bad as someone who destroys things. If we don't gather, we scatter, it said. There's no middle ground. Matthew 12 and verse 30, anyone who isn't with me, says Jesus, opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. If your car breaks down, how are you going to move it if you just sit there? You actually have to get out and push. If you just sit in it, you're protected and it's comfortable, but it won't help the situation. You need to get out and push to make progress. All of us have sinned against the Lord. Remember Moses said, but if you fail to keep your word, then you will have sinned against the Lord. Have you kept your word since giving your life to Christ? Whatever we do or do not do for the church or for the Lord, it affects Christ. The Apostle Paul had learned that from when he persecuted the church. You know, when he was caught persecuting the church and the Lord stopped him in his tracks, what did he say? Why do you persecute me? That's in Acts 9 and the first five verses. When we sin against each other, we sin against Christ. Paul points it out. He learnt that lesson and tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 12. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. What an awesome responsibility we have to the memory of those who brought us to Christ and for Christ who saved us in the first place. Our sin will find us out, but also if we're involved in the fight, that will become evident too. It will come out in the growth of your spiritual life, the fruit of the Spirit. If you're with a congregation, it will come out in the growth of the congregation. But this growth is only possible if all are playing their part. We are part of a body. We're a family. And each must do what they are called to do. Even if you're isolated, you're part of the family, the body, and you have something to do. In Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. It's all about love. Love for Christ, love for those we're thankful for, for what they've done for us, and love for the lost. Growth may occur with inactive Christians. God's word will still go out somehow, but the growth will be hampered, stunted, slowed down. When Reuben and Gad realised the effect of sitting there while their brethren went to war, they immediately made arrangements to do their share. Moses was even patient with them, let them sort the families out, get things settled, get things organised, so that they could then go into war without worrying about what's happening at home. Numbers 32 and 24 points that out to us. So deal with what you need to deal with, but never forget, don't neglect what we need to do for the Lord. Because of this, they promise to do their part in going to war. We're all affected by busyness these days. And if we are busy and start to get frustrated with others, let's be patient, as Moses was patient. No one's going to be breathing down your neck, keeping count of how many people you've told about Jesus, keeping count of how many meetings you've attended. All these things will become self-evident, and it's between you and God ultimately. But we must be patient in helping our brethren prepare for the battle. Some may be young in the faith and 
well, you've been a Christian for a long time, so they're not going to be as far in their journey as you are. Maybe you've flaked out a little bit, you've been discouraged, and someone who's really zealous because it's new to them has come along, and there might be friction between you. Overcome it. Whatever stage of the life of faith we are at, some will be more mature, some will be less mature. But let's help each other to help others find Christ. Let's lead by example. Do not decide to sit there because others are not pulling their weight. Determine personally not to rest until the work is done. No matter what others are or are not doing, you be diligent in your faith. You be diligent in your own spiritual battles. Be active in whatever service you can do for the Lord. And that service should be what you're best suited to. God will give you the gift that you need to do the job you're called to do. Don't feel bad and complain that you can't do something you're not suited for. Do the thing you are suited for. Someone else needs to be doing that other thing. Just don't sit while others work. Are you in the army of Christ, actively engaged in the service of his kingdom? Or would you like help and direction? Speak up, find someone to talk to, get help. Let's do things together, wherever you are, wherever we're located. We can help one another to reach out and fight this battle against Satan. If you happen to be hearing this and you're not in Christ and have yet to do what you need to do in order to be forgiven, again, don't just sit there. Do something about what you've heard about Jesus. Forgiveness waits for you. Heaven has a place for you. Somewhere, someone can help you. And if you're hearing this, get in touch with us through the uh, means of, of the, this digital age. Everyone has the opportunity to find out more and be able to be equipped to do more. Just, or rather, don't just sit there.